Hello and welcome to Corrine and Rose's EdTech Roundup. I'm Rose Luckett, UCL professor and founder of Educate Ventures Research Limited. Now, the EdTech Roundup is a series of the EdTech podcast designed for educators, learners, parents, anyone who wants to understand technology, learning or teaching. In each episode of the Roundup, we spend about 40 minutes looking at what's in the news, have an interview with a special guest, discuss a product review. We usually put in a topical top tech tip and we might also discuss a question from a viewer if they sent some into the podcast. Now, I did say Karine and Rose's EdTech Roundup, but it's only me doing the Roundup at the moment. Karine will be back with us again in the autumn, which will be great. But I'm actually not on my own today because in the studio with me, I have a great friend and colleague, Dr. Andrew Morris, Honorary Associate Professor from UCL, Institute of Education, former president of the education section of the British Science Association and author of the book, Bugs, Drugs and Three Pin Plugs, Everyday Science Simply Explained. This is now available wherever you get your books from, and I thoroughly recommend it. It has some fascinating chapters. How do pills know where to go? Why your ears go pop? These are all questions that we need to have answered. Um, And so I recommend this book because each chapter deals with a very everyday question or issue or challenge, and then explains the science behind this. So there's a couple of things caught my attention in the news over the past few days. So I thought they were worth having a little look at. So in particular, there was an article in The Guardian on Monday uh, entitled Put Learners First, UNESCO Calls for a Global Ban on Smartphones in Schools, which I thought was quite an interesting piece. And actually, the report behind this piece, which you can download from the UNESCO website, is uh, over 400 pages long and deals with a lot of issues with respect to technology and education. And it's actually really well worth um, having a read. But it did make me think about the way that we often expect a technology to be able to meet the needs of a particular user group when it may not necessarily be best placed. And so, you know, a smartphone in a school that's not being used for a specific learning activity not surprisingly, may well be a distraction. And of course, there are many other problems associated with the sorts of activities that often people use smartphones for, such as social media. And we know there are many issues with young people using social media. But it struck me when I was reading this article, and indeed when I had a look at the the, the report behind that article, that actually in terms of parents, teachers, learners, whoever we are, There are some fairly straightforward questions we can ask ourselves when we're thinking about technology that can be quite helpful in terms of making a decision about a technology and whether it might be useful for learning and whether it might not. So, for example, why is the technology being used in the classroom or the lecture hall, whatever it is, and what's its learning purpose? Does the learning purpose or activity for which the technology is being used match the functionality of the technology. So is there a good match between what you're trying to do and what the technology can do? Does the person using the technology know how to use the technology effectively for that kind of learning activity? Are the other resources that are required for the technology in question to be used effectively for learning also in place? And is there good evidence to support the belief that the technology being used will be effective for this learning activity? with this learner in this context? And of course, that final question about evidence is one that's very close to my heart and indeed is very close to the heart of our guest today, Dr. Andrew Morris, because we do need to get much better at producing and learning from evidence about specific technologies being used with specific types of learners for particular tasks and in particular ways. But I recommend people have a look at that report from UNESCO. It is long, uh, but... There are many really interesting aspects to the report and it is freely downloadable from the UNESCO website. Now, the second thing I wanted to draw attention to, and this is, to be frank, a little bit of a shameless plug for our newsletter. It's called The Skinny on AI in Education, and it's available again free from the Educate Ventures website. And for each issue, we try and pick up on 
the really key things that are happening in AI that are relevant to education. So it's about AI in education, but it's also about AI generally, if the things that are happening in AI generally have a particular relevance for education. So, for example, in the second issue, we draw attention to the fact that there's quite a significant amount of investment being made in companies who specialize in the use of hyper real deep fake videos. Now, I think there are some significant and rather worrying aspects of that kind of work for education. And we all need to be thinking about the way in which we are able to differentiate or indeed not able to differentiate between real and fake information, a really important part of the way technology and in particular AI is impacting on education. And we'll come back to the subject of AI in the questions that Andrew and I will be discussing. So I really encourage you to have a look at the skinny because it does try and pull together current news with respect to AI and education. So without further ado, let's go to the main part of the podcast today, which is the discussion with Andrew. Now, Andrew and I have been colleagues for many years, and we both share a real passion in evidence, research, policy and practice with respect to education. So in addition to the book that I was talking about earlier, which I do think has an amazing title. I'm going to say it again and hope that I won't trip over my words. Bugs, Drugs and Three Pin Plugs, Everyday Science Simply Explained. Andrew has also written many, many articles and is a really key practitioner when it comes to science. So I'm really pleased that you're able to join us here today in our little podcast studio, Andrew, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. So I want to start off by talking to you a little bit about the ways in which people who have previously been switched off from science when they've been at school still maintain that curiosity about what science is and can become re-engaged in science at a later point in life, which is wonderful to hear. I'd really like, as you answer my first question, for you to tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. But what I'm really interested in is how does this happen? How do people become disenfranchised with science and yet still maintain this curiosity and want to come back? They haven't been completely put off by what has happened to them at school and they they really still do want to engage with science. Passionate though we are about evidence, I have to start with a belief rather (laughs) rather than solid evidence, which is I just believe that people are naturally curious, which is obvious in infancy, uh, as it could drive parents mad, the amount of questioning. Uh, But I think it remains uh, throughout life. That's that's my belief. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit later about what I did about testing this in a practical situation. But just to come direct to your your question, what I find by experience, is that most people do have an interest in science, whether or not they see it that way, whether they call it science, just as they do about all sorts of other issues that are also academic subjects, like politics uh, and history and social science uh, and art and so on, literature. Uh, I think the motivation of science is, is much the same. Uh, Of course, this is in contradiction to how science is normally seen. It's normally seen as different and difficult. Tax it not for me. Uh, It's repeatedly the case for women and girls to make statements like, I never got on with it, It, it's not for me, etc. And by the way, there's another whole branch of evidence about the gendering in science education and science history, uh, and possibly science method as well. So that there are, I think, particularly in my subject, which is physics, there there are some issues about whether the subject as it's presented is slanted um, towards the male gaze, as it were. But that, that's another issue. So um, people are curious. And what, what the evidence of my groups, I've been running these discussion groups now for 20, 22 years, um, they talk about all sorts of questions and observations 
maybe bringing up children, maybe looking after the elderly, maybe uh, do with gardening and plants. It might be the weather. It might be looking up in, in wonderment uh, at the stars or looking at the sky or the clouds. It can be scenery, mountains, rivers. Um, it could even be once, once it was about how you stay upright on a bicycle. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> there's, all, there's all sorts of essentially scientific bases to things we encounter every day. Uh, and, of course, it, this does is made manifest by the TV programmes like the Brian Cox and the David Attenborough programmes, which are obviously um, express people's appetite and curiosity for, to know about things of a huge, huge range uh, from biological things to astronomical things. But this is the big question. This is completely detached from any experience they have of science as it comes through the schooling. And so that's where the problem lies, not in science, but in the school curriculum. I hear what you're saying, and I think science is seen as a difficult subject. And actually, you're right, particularly physics, I think, perhaps more so I don't know, but it, it feels to me as if it, it, if it's often seen as being particularly difficult. So that re-sparking and your belief in curiosity, which I share, how do you how does that manifest itself, and how do you engage people yeah. in those discussion groups that you were talking about that you've been running for quite a long time? So this was a this was an experiment that I set up in uh, the Mary Ward Centre, an adult education centre. I, be, I, I've, I used to teach A level and B tech in city and guilds courses in further education, and I became totally disillusioned about the damage that the A level syllabus was doing to the scientific spirit. It was requiring people to become rote learners, to memorise facts, and to dampen down their curiosity, dampen down creativity and imagination. All of which are at the heart of real science, which is really creative and imaginative. So I found an adult education centre that was free from exams, free from syllabuses, set up uh, a course in a humanities department appealing to non-science students, saying, look, bring your questions, we'll build a curriculum as we go along in response to whatever you're interested about. And uh, that succeeded, and the, 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 the participants wanted to continue long after the course was uh, abolished through Ofsted's inspection. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's kept going for 22 years in, in cafes and online now. And the, the, the first thing that I to do, I knew I had to do this because I'd had experiences of psychological therapy myself in which to, to, to try and make people feel good about something and get them out of fear and anxiety, you need to create a kind of therapeutic environment uh, in which they are able to express themselves as much as possible and to uproot some of their dear, deepest feelings. And of course, my, my contention was that the blockage with science and certainly with maths is fear and anxiety uh, for, for adults. Um, it's their memory of humiliation at school, uh, feeling of inferiority. And most of these people I've, who've been in my groups are highly uh, competent in, in general, in other subjects. So the, the, the motivation, why did they want to join a course about investigating science when they've got a negative background, is really the feeling of sort of shame and in, injustice that they were behind hand in science, continually having to apologise or actually make defensive remarks about their mathematical ability or their scientific knowledge, when in fact they were sort of fully functioning, capable people. So for the first few sessions, it's all about setting ground rules, like you can say anything you like, I want you to express what you think, even if you're unsure whether it's just ill-informed and unscientific, and we'll work with whatever whatever you are saying and letting me know. And, and that's what worked. The, the real trick that I got is that teaching, communicating and teaching science is not an exercise in question and answer. It's not a quiz. It's not about a body of factual knowledge that you're tick boxing whether you've got it or not. It's, it's about a dialogue and uh, moving through your experience, your observations, and the established body of knowledge and, and exchanging between between these things. Got, there's lo lots of examples about this. 
And so what, what would happen is people would ask a simple question, uh, you know, why is the sky blue or whatever it is. And I knew that it wasn't just going to finish when I told them the answer. But well, because, well, first of all, I wasn't going to tell them the answer. That, that's the psychotherapy. You don't, you don't tell the answer. You explore the issue together. So we would find out what they knew about the nature of light what the, and, and what they knew about the nature of colour, and then that you'd get into electromagnetic waves. Uh, and then very soon, below the question of why is the sky blue, you're actually introducing really true foundational science, wave theory, electromagnetic theory, without using those words, without naming those as as the syllabus items you know you're not saying today we do electromagnetic theory that would have switched them off uh but we do talk about why the sky is blue and, and at the end of it they've become acquainted with the concept of electromagnetic waves and i'm not in any way saying they are then fully trained in electromagnetic theory of course not it's a sort of introduction um, yeah, so that, that's one of the ways of, so the first thing about engaging is that they're curious and they want to make good this sort of injustice in, the, in their repertoire. But the second thing is the method, which is to make them feel safe. And secondly, not to just answer questions like a quiz, but to dig down until you get to some fundamental concept. And then, then they're really learning science rather than just answering questions. It sounds so great to me. I can really imagine enjoying that kind of session. And I'm sure a lot of people less listening will think, well, I would enjoy something like that. You know, these are questions that, you know, are about the world we live in. It's helping us to understand why things are the way they are. And it's very different to the way formal education goes about science. You've already mentioned that a little bit, Andrew, and you, you mentioned Ofsted. And one could also mention the assessment system. We had the A-level results this week. You know, there are many structures within our current education system that are not anything like the kind of experience that you're talking about when it comes to teaching and learning. And, And I really wonder what you feel the formal education system could learn from the practices that you've engaged with for over 20 years and seen have an impact on people in helping them to re-engage with science and learn. What what could we learn that would be useful for our formal education systems from the kind of work you've been doing? We need a science for everyone, as well as a science for future scientists. That's it. That it's as simple as that. But the present system is really all geared up ultimately to selecting people for university technical courses medical, scientific, engineering. And to get there, because the requirement is that the university admissions tutors require people to have a level of knowledge, mostly factual knowledge, uh, prior to entering university. And of course, that's not true for law or architecture or other subjects, but it is true in the technical subjects. Because of that, they have to get quite a long way through the sixth form in A-level a or BTEC, and prepare for, that, prepare for that, they have to get quite a long way at GCSE. Uh, so from the age of about 13, the trajectory is that everybody is exposed to the science that's needed for a few to get into technical degrees. And there are several problems with that. One, of course, it puts people off. It's intimidating so on. Another is that it's cumulative. So unlike sort of um, cyclical subjects, which use a kind of what we call a helical or spiral curriculum, where, where you go round and round, it's much more common in a primary school, you go round and round topics, touching as people mature, to touching at higher and higher levels on the same topic. It's a kind of linear cumulative thing. So if you're ill for a few weeks, or if you don't get on with a teacher, and that's highly likely, there's a lot of uh, problems about science teaching, uh, then you miss a chunk out. And then you're quite likely, this is repeatedly reported to me by people in my groups, that that's it, they cut out at a certain point, that's it forever. So yeah, what's needed is obviously they're much 
I'm not in any way saying what I'm talking about replaces the way we're going to get our future nuclear engineers. Of course not. There, there's, there's a real importance about you know, hacking your way through historical material in science disciplines. And it's, a, it's absolutely fantastic, the structure of disciplines and, and the work that's gone into developing theory and, and, and experimental practice and so on. That's all got, got to occur for some people, but it is a minority. So I think there's got to be a, another sort of science curriculum that everybody can engage in. And then there's got to be a kind of bolt-on additional curriculum that the, those who are going to go on to specialise do in addition to that. And if we had that more general curriculum, maybe more people would end up wanting to go into the specialist science study. I think there's a parallel in artificial intelligence as well. It's becoming apparent now that actually we do need an AI for everyone because everyone needs some kind of understanding of artificial intelligence because it's everywhere, it's impacting on people's lives and work. But that's very different to the AI that we want our future builders of new AI systems to study. We need different ways of engaging with important subject areas like science. So I really empathise with what you're saying, and it makes a lot of sense to me. And I do worry about the number of students that are turned off um, many subjects that seem to be too hard or too technical, and then they miss that vital piece of learning. And then it's so hard for them to ever get back into it again because all the other bits are building on the bit that that they haven't got. I know as somebody who struggled at secondary school myself, you know, I missed a considerable amount of my early secondary school education. And I found the number of times that I had this big hole and it was really hard to then, but I didn't have the right thing to build on. And I'd have to go back and find out what it was that I hadn't learned that I shouldn't have learned so that I could then, so it took longer because, <laughs> you know, there, there were too many missing bits. Um, so it, it really is an issue and some people don't have the opportunity to fill in those gaps. So I think what you're saying makes a huge amount of sense. But just to add a bit to that, a couple of other points. I mean, things like the Open University and the Adult Mature Access courses show that the slow cumulative memorization of facts is not the only way. There are many individuals who return to science in a mature way through either the OU or access courses and you know, become very effective scientists. So you can accelerate. I mean, once you're motivated and you're uh, you, and you're switched on to science, you can learn very, very rapidly. The other point I want to make, of course, is A-level results. I, I had a look at them for this time, and there's been a slight increase in biology and chemistry A-levels taken, a slight increase, but not as much as the average increase of all A-levels. There's been an increase in all A-levels this year. About 4%, I think, more A-levels taken. And uh, 1% or 2% or 3% in biology and chemistry. But in physics, it's a downturn. Even fewer people are wow. taking physics now. And there's been a lot of research. The Institute of Physics is very very good on all this, very strong, does has a strong research outf outfit. And they're researching girls and physics, which is all negative style. And the most recent report I read was that girls who did well in physics GCSE, as well as the boys, dropped it. They they didn't go on to A-level. Uh, so th there's a real crisis uh, at a deep level. I think most of what I feel is actually about my subject, physics, rather than all sciences. It's, it's particularly noticeable in physics. So girls with physics ability are switching off at 16. It's open to research to what extent that is because the, it, the curriculum is itself gendered or because of sort of social is and psychological issues of growing up as a girl when you're 16 or so and what what's acceptable um, socially. I yeah. wish that we had invited our head of AI from Educate Ventures Research because she did physics at university, astrophysics and taught physics, and it would be really interesting to get her view on what kept her going from from, yeah. from GCSE to yeah. A level because I, I you know I know from like you from looking at the data that that there is this big drop off um and it, it's really worrying you know I was very struck and I realized this is of a time you know 
I went to see the film Oppenheimer, like many people, I'm sure. I was very struck by how male dominated <laughs> the science that science world was in that. And I just wonder to what extent it's changed. I'm sure it has a bit, but it, it is an I issue. It has improved, yeah. And certainly the images you see on TV of female astronomers and so on, there is obviously a big Absolutely. effort to represent women in science and engineering, physics and engineering particularly. Factor I must just give give reference to is the narrowness of A-levels. I mean, we're unique in this country, requiring people to narrow down to three A-levels. Um, and I, I remember this myself at, at school, that uh, I, I was told I had to do maths if I was going to do physics, which is true. You can't really, uh, it's slightly better now. When I, when I was uh, in school in the 60s, uh, it was absolutely necessary to do uh, pure and applied maths to, to cope with physics. So that's two out of three taken. And if, like me, you're interested in other things as well, it, 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 it's a real downer. So a huge responsibility for what's going wrong lies with our A-level structure, the structure of our A-level system. And this narrowness, yeah, I, I can relate to that, absolutely. Just going back to films for a moment, I'm going to take a little bit of a diversion for the moment because I like to find out a few interesting facts about our guests but for, for listeners so i am going to ask you uh what your favorite film is your favorite book what kind of music do you like band or song just so that we get a little sense of, of who you are andrew <laughs> well I, i'm quite clear about film i i mean i've got a, a a rather sort of art art house attitude to films and i saw this incredible film called the spider stratagem by bernardo bertolucci years um, and years years and years ago uh, it's just the most amazing. Watching this film unravel, you don't know where it's going. You don't know what it's about. And then you reflect on it afterwards. You realise how profound it is. Basically, it's about a, 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 a young man going back to this small town in the middle of nowhere by train in Italy. And his father's died. And he's sort of poking around about trying to find out about his father. He doesn't really know his father very well, speaking to his father's friends and so on. And he gradually unearths the whole huge hidden story about his father. And and in a way, I suppose it's just resonated uh, a lot for me uh, when you're young, not knowing things, and then, uh, you know, gradually finding out and as a result maturing and cha changing your views of things as a result of finding out on a popular front i i actually adored another film when i was a young man i went to america uh five easy pieces by jack nicholson uh with, with jack nicholson in it uh which was another sort of revelation when i was a uh, in my 20s i was mentioning having to do maths and physics at school uh the other thing was that i was very uh very involved with flute playing i'd become quite advanced as a flute player oh. so i took a i was determined to take a level music which i did and then for the whole of my life up until i was about 28 i was divided between whether i was going to go into science or flute professional flute playing music so uh yeah yeah i i got involved uh, when i was 14 i started having a uh, lessons with a a great flute player in London, and then I he sent me to Paris, where I studied with another great flute player for a, for a while, and then I got involved with all sorts of orchestras and chamber music groups, uh, and uh, I set up an orchestra in Leeds when I was there doing my doctorate, and then and then uh, I played the big orchestra, the Salomon Orchestra in London, and um, met up with three other principal players there, and we formed a cello music group in 1981. That's 42 years ago. And to this day, we carry on giving concerts, uh, often in churches and for charities, uh, uh, and, and we, we practice weekly. So uh, that's my music. I'm a very, very active classical musician, flute playing. These questions are so wonderful for finding out about people. That's fantastic. I never knew that. That's amazing. Yeah. Very impressive. I, I live a double life in that regard, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, Mike, the final in this set about books, I don't know what we might find out now. <laughs> no, I can't really say I do. Uh, I mean, the thing that is salient is that I've always found it difficult reading nonfiction. I've never really got the, the basis of novels. And so I really... Uh, 
I'm fascinated by things like sort of uh, they're called psychogeography. You know, books about the the the, the world and the planet and economics. Uh, fantastic guns, germs, and steel about how our study of of seed fertility influenced the growth of nations. And um, right now, I'm reading an amazing book called The Music of Life by the great physiologist Dennis Noble, which is about he, he he's saying that. Um, it's been a big mistake to think a human life is all based on the genome, the, the set of genes that we have. And he's saying that's just that's just the blueprint. That's just the code. Uh, the, what, what really matters about life is the cell and the, all the components other than the, the code book that go to make us human beings. So uh, that's what I'm reading right now. And it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. It sounds fascinating. I, again, I can very much relate to that. That's brilliant. Thank you, Andrew. Right, back to the interview questions. <laughs> we were talking a little earlier, Andrew, about the way that um, technology has helped your groups to continue during the pandemic and actually how I think you were saying it's increased the number of people who are able to come to the meetings. Can you just say a little bit more about that? Because I think it's quite interesting. We originally met in this adult education centre and it had a whiteboard and coloured marker pens and that that was the the style back in 2001. Uh, And I would sort of uh, put up questions and draw things on, on a board. Then we moved into a wine bar and we didn't have a resource like that. But it was amazing how much physics you can get out of ice cubes in a in a <laughs> ice cubes in a gin a glass of gin. And uh and people started bringing things in. I remember Nana one day she just bought in a, a CD and we were looking at the colored uh the colored uh lines you get when you ref- when you flash a CD in a, in light and you see that the colors are different. In different lighting. So if you're in a, a bright white light, you know, or if you're in a sodium street lighting. So that took us into uh, the electromagnetic spectrum again. Uh, so it's amazing how many things you can, um, you, how much phys- physics you can discuss out of ordinary objects. And then gradually, basically, the internet was 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 coming on stream in the mobile phone. And at first, these were not uh, artifacts in our discussions. But then gradually, some of these sort of more advanced technophiles would bring in a mobile phone in, into the group. And so we'd all be saying, you know, uh, uh, how many uh, how many uh, molecules are there in an average human cell? And uh, we'd say, oh, gosh, you know, who knows that? And so I'd better go away and read up about that. Uh, by the way, opening oneself up to talking about any science question means that you're not going to know the, the facts about most of the stuff you but the undertakers will go back and we'll look we'll look up the facts later the key thing today is the concepts you know what are the underlying concepts so we talk about cells we talk about molecules we try and talk about the scale what's the size of a molecule compared to the size of a cell and then one of the people in the group would suddenly pipe up and say oh it's uh five and a half billion uh and they they sort of quickly checked it out on their mobile phone so gradually, and this has increased, so gradually the mobile phone is an active ingredient in our sessions. Um, so we, we have, say, five or six people talk, discussing something, and then one of them bows out for a minute and is, is checking out some facts. So that's really changed during the course of the last 20 years. And then what I, because I'm concerned about consolidating knowledge uh, and not just having a chat, um, I keep a note of the whole conversation, what they say and what I say. And then I go home and then I write it up. And then all the questions that have been asked that we couldn't address up at the time, I research uh, on the internet or in my bookcase, you know, the, the books I've got. So I then return a record of the discussion we had with a record of what they've said uh, so it kind of reinforces the value of their contributions to the discussion. And 
also add in the knowledge that I've I've acquired from the internet. So now I now actually pay a, a monthly sum to Wikipedia because Wikipedia has been so fun, foundational in in my ability to to do what I always wanted to do, which is to be a generalist in science. Not not not. I don't want to just. I never. When I'd done my PhD, I decided not to be a specialist scientist uh, with a kind of micro specialism. Uh, but to, I wanted to be a generalist and a communicator. So I went into teaching with with a real will. I wanted to teach, uh, and um, I wanted to be broad across all scientific issues. You know. Which, which of course you can't you can't possibly know everything in all sciences, but with with the availability of Wikipedia, it's it, and, and there's plenty of other fantastic sources as well uh, on the internet. Uh, yeah, m- most of the questions that we need factual information about are available through the internet. So fantastic dependence dependence now on and so phones are a useful source for you thinking about the first news item that we talked about right at the start of this pod you know phones and schools could be problematic but for an adult learning group such as yours having somebody with a mobile phone who can look information up on the internet is really really useful and do you still meet in the pub or do you meet online now (laughs) well we've been been meeting online for three years since the pandemic so we had our first in-person meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago in King's Cross area, and uh, only half of the people could actually make it when it came to it. And so we had a hybrid, you know, we, we had our iPad there. And, and two, well, nice. now three of them are in America. One's in Arizona, one's in Washington, uh, so, uh, and another one's intermittently. So we're, we're always going to have a degree of hybrid anyway. I just wanted to mention, apropos of that use of technology, I, I also have been – influential in a, a research network for FE colleges, which has been going uh, for since 1996, Lending and Skills Research Network. And they had their first, in, we used to have regular conferences. Um, then we've had the first in-person conference after three years of Zooming in Birmingham uh, a few months ago. And one of the FE teachers, who was a maths teacher from a college, did the most incredible presentation in which he it was about an iPad. He, and he he put his whole lesson onto an iPad. And he gave this sparkling presentation where he showed all the deficiencies of the previous media. So when you had a blackboard, he, he made a joke of it. You basically, you got your back to the students when you're writing. Then when we had an OHP, you basically cast a great big shadow over the screen. So he kind of dismissed the previous technology. Then he showed what you can do with an iPad. And he got all his materials already on the iPad. And he then stood, and it was all linked up to the smart screen, so he could control what was going up on the smart screen. Then he went to the back of the classroom, so he got away from the front of the class. So he taught the whole class from behind them. And, of course, he could choose to stand himself close to the most disruptive pupils, uh, students. Uh, and of course, that so had an instant effect, it could instant transformation on behavior and attention in standing at the front. And then he could do things like set them a task and then zoom in and photograph the work that somebody was doing and project it onto the screen and ask the other students to critique the work of one student and then do another student, another student, not, not picking on anybody, and just so he could publicize the work that individual students were doing and get the group to, as it were, you, you know, look for pros and cons in, in what each other was doing. So it's, it's, it sounded to me like a most dynamic way of teaching. Getting it's a away great example. Things. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I think it's an excellent example. Realise that we've got quite lost in conversation and we're getting a little short of time. So I'm going to have to make Go this on. last question a bit of a brief one, but I don't want to leave without asking you this, because I think it's really important. There's so much hype around AI at the moment. Every week, there are stories, positive, negative, scientists saying we should be worried, other scientists saying that we shouldn't. I think it's really hard for people to know how to engage with AI. So in the same way that you've spent a lot of time 
trying to re-engage people in science and to demystify some of the complexity that might have put them off science. How do you think we can best help people to engage with AI so that it doesn't stay as a complete mystery to them? Because I'm worried that that would be a very bad thing for society. Interesting. This this topic did come up, as you'd imagine, uh, in my science groups during this year. One of the one of the people, Debbie, in one of the groups had used chats, is it GPT or GTP? Yeah, to see if it could come up with uh, a, a, a piece of text that she was was part of her job. She had to generate this piece of text. It was about a policy. Um, and she was quite impressed that the, the product from the AI software was possible as a piece of policy, a policy document in as required. So she came away with rather, she was quite impressed basically but she works on university administrators so they're of course obsessed with problems of plagiarism and and uh, so on so and I, I i'm not directly involved in the use of ai in education but i i i do follow a few debates and there's no doubt that it's it's a completely sort of a mixed mixed message a mixed issue isn't it that some people are, are, are saying we must sort of be alert to some of the be- a lot of the benefits that will happen uh, and others are talking about the damage. Um, wh- one particular thing that I want to say from my own opinion is that wouldn't it be wonderful if this could transform what we think assessment is all about? It, in the moment, we think that recalling factual knowledge in an exam is, is a good mark of whether a person is, you know, is highly qualified or not. But what if we said, well, oh, well, just producing an essay, uh, it, you know, it's um, it, it could all be loaded down through um, through uh, soft, through software what so um, what about finding other ways of working out whether the learning has taken place like um viva voce like or, or discussion how about interrogating people's understanding rather than their factual recall i mean i i've been repeatedly uh, struck how scientists at every stage when i was in my doctorate postdoctorate meeting academics and so on how little they really understood the basic concepts away from their specialism. So they may be a physicist, and they may know an awful lot about the formation of black holes, but they're not really very sure about the biophysics of nerve conduction. Uh, So specialism has led people to acquire uh, excellence in science and be advanced, advanced status without necessarily having developed a good conceptual understanding. So how about finding ways of not just testing their facts, but finding out whether something's been understood? And a good way of doing that is by discussing it with them and seeing what they say. However, more more important, uh, there's a paper out just this month. It's not yet. It's a preprint at the moment. It's open access paper by Bill and William and John Hattie, who are two uh, experts in uh, assessing the quality of research evidence in education about AI in education. And they're alerting us to a further sort of level of all this. They said, okay, there's a lot of debate now about things you can and can't do in the classroom or things that might or might not happen in assessment. But he said there's, they are pointing to the fact there's much deeper issues for education other than classroom tactics. Just asking the question, how fast will these general GPT software out compete humans in important ways and it conjecture is it could be within a matter of years and he, what he's suggesting is will education become less necessary will the motivation to learn the motive the motive to learn the reason why you go into education to learn something be devalued uh, because the, the the bots are doing it uh, and so he's Questioning whether we're reaching a peak in educability, you know, whether whether the requirement ah. for humans to be educated is peaking. That's, such, that's so interesting, Andrew. I'm actually going to be talking about that paper in the next issue of the Skinny. Um, and I think the point is that a, I think we have to help the general public get a general understanding about AI in the yeah. same way that we have 
numeracy literacy we need people to gain ai literacy of course we need people who then do the specialist knowledge just as we've talked about with science but the thing about assessment is absolutely the point we have to change assessment and we have to change education because these systems are perfectly capable of memorizing the facts and regurgitating the facts they're not capable of understanding they don't know anything and so we need to revise our assessment systems so that we do as you've just been saying go much further towards testing understanding. But the really crucial part is that I don't think we can see our intelligence as a finished product. Our intelligence is evolving as well. And now we have these machines that can do that memorization part of intelligence. We need to step up the sophistication of our own intelligence so that we stay ahead. So I would say there's an even greater role for education completely the opposite to the to, to peak education absolutely not we now need more and we've got to ramp it up because if we want to remain as the intelligence in the universe so to speak the real key core sophisticated intelligence and we know the human brain is capable of forms of intelligence that ai isn't so we really need to have our education systems focus on those and not on the ones that we now know that we can automate. But back to you for a final word on this. Yeah, no, yes, and I completely agree with you. And I realise I diverted from your original question. Um, Loud. About, about how um, how one sort of brings AI into a no- the normal realm of people's awareness. And we, in the discussion about this, that inspired me to write a blog about it. And... What I found, my, the, the point I, I realised I'm most uncomfortable about is the word intelligence, um, because it, it, it's rather assuming that the acquisition of factual knowledge and storage and recall of factual knowledge is equivalent to intelligence, which is a sort of far from the truth. So I thought what I need to do in this blog and what I need to do to bring AI into the public realm of people who don't know what the heck it is, um, I wanted really to get down to neural networks and to, because I think neural networks are fascinating. I, th- I think the whole idea of uh, massive amounts of data presenting patterns. Yes. Uh, I've been involved with text mining as well and so on. I think this is a very fascinating bit of science, but not the first point. So I think what I realised is, uh, is that mechanical and artificial means of appearing to have human attributes is, is, a, is an ancient thing. Uh, when you think of sort of fairground uh, organs, which can, or, or, or prepared pianos, pianos, piano roll, uh, or those funny little Swiss music music machines, you know, which, which just use sort of cogwheels with pins in them to, to make appear to make music. You, you realise that forms of representing human uh, activity through artificial or mechanical means, are, are been with us for a long time. And so I, I think one can gradually position this, essentially the neural network uh, advance in the history of development of technologies which take on various appearances of human behaviour and human aptitudes. Uh, and, really and, and interesting. Avoid- yeah, avoid using buying straight to the word intelligence, which supply which implies you know some otherworldly kind of uh, yeah. I think that's business. a really important point that the the word intelligence is problematic. I, yeah. I agree with you. I think it is a, it's something to be thought about deeply and is a way through differentiating what we've got now from what humans can do. But you're right; it's also problematic. That's a brilliant place to stop. Thank you so much, Andrew. I really, really enjoyed our discussion today. It's been fascinating, and I'm sure that the listeners would enjoy it too. I wish we had more time to talk. Unfortunately, we don't. So I'm going to have to to wrap things up now. I will just very quickly give our listeners the topical top tech tip because I don't like to leave that out. And it's very much related to what Andrew and I have been talking about. And that is, I'm going to suggest that you try Claude, that's C-L-A-U-D, which is a chatbot produced by a company called Anthropic. The founders of Anthropic, one of whom worked for the company 
OpenAI that produced ChatGPT have a foundation in developing safe AI systems. They're really interested in the safety aspect of AI, building reliable, steerable AI systems, as they say. It's a free tool um, and it's worth having a play with it and seeing how you can use these tools. I find particularly useful using tools like Claude for summarizing a text, a long text, for extracting key pieces of information. They're very useful for these particular sorts of operational tasks. So that's my topical top tech tip for this week to have a play with Claude. I'm afraid we haven't got time for the question from listeners this week. So I'll roll that on to the next podcast, but that's fine. All that's left for me to do today is to say thank you so much for Andrew. We've hugely appreciated having you on today's episode. Um, and I'm also going to say that I'm hugely excited that we're going to be launching a very new mini series all about AI on education in the coming months. We'll be recording the first episode, we hope, before the end of this month. And there'll be five episodes in total that will be coming out in the autumn. So I'm just going to plug those because I think I am sure, in fact, that they will be very interesting for listeners. We've got some amazing guests coming on um, to discuss the issues with respect to AI and education. So I hope wherever you've been listening today, you have found our discussion informative and practical and useful and that you've got something you can take away. Please do remember to send us in your questions if you have them that would be great and you can see the email address for sending those in the pod notes and you can see everything you need to know about the edtech podcast at www.theedtechpodcast.com and at www.educateventures.com thank you very much for listening and i wish you all a great week